Welcome to Satsang. Let's begin with just a few moments of quiet meditation together. Allow, allow the eyes to be closed. And allow the other senses to pull inward. Bring the attention to those senses. And really feel yourself pulling them in from being focused on the world outside to being focused on the world inside. Draw the awareness to your breath. Don't think about the breath, but just allow the awareness to merge with the breath. As it flows in, and flows out. If thoughts come, or any sensations from the outer world come, don't try to fight them off, but also don't allow your awareness to get distracted by them. Keep drawing the awareness gently but firmly back to the breath. And as the awareness merges with the breath, in a continuous flow of inhalation and exhalation. Notice how the very border and boundary of the self begins to dissolve. We're breathing in from the world outside to inside. Breathing out from the inside to the outside. And allow it to just become this continual wave of the self breathing into the self.
If you find that the mind still wanders, you can give it a gentle mantra. You can chant so on the inhalation and hum on the exhalation. So, hum. So, hum. It means I am that. I am one with all that exists. I'm one with the creator, one with the creation. So, And just keep drawing the awareness back to the breath. There will always be distractions. There will always be fluctuations in the mind and the world outside. But allow your mind your experience to be focused As the breath flows in and flows out, resist any urge to move the body. Let the body stay absolutely still because the mind follows the body. All that's moving is the breath gently the self breathing into the self and out to the self. No borders, no boundaries. No inner or outer, just the self, breathing into self.
gently bring the palms of your hands together in namaste, chest level, and rub them gently against each other. Press the palms of your hands into your closed eyes. And slowly open the eyes and lower the hands. Welcome. We're okay. Okay. So before we start, if those of you on this side could just move a little bit this way, just so that as people come in that door, there's room and they can just slide in easily and not over people. Wonderful. How do we keep balance between our ego and our heart? So the ego is actually something that we need in order to really be able to live in our hearts and from our hearts. And as the truth of who we are, we need to be able to not be living from the ego. Now, a lot of times on a spiritual path, if you read, if you listen to a lot, you'll hear people using words like annihilating the ego, fighting the ego, battling the ego. And the intention is very good because the last thing you want is the ego running your life. The problem for me on a personal experiential level is what I found when I would do battle with my ego was Regardless of who won each particular battle, I was sleeping with the loser. At the end of the day, you're all in bed together. And so for me, what has worked much better is an awareness, not of I'm going to kill you, because remember, when the mind says, even the high-intentioned spiritual mind says, ah, today I'm going to battle my ego. Well, guess who's listening? Guess who's also there in the mind hearing you say, today's the day I squash the ego? The ego. And everything in life from a tiny mosquito wants to live. I mean, try to, try to kill a mosquito that's flying around your room, right? You think, I'm so big, I'm so smart, this tiny little thing. Everything in the world has a survival instinct, including your ego. And so the dilemma that I have found is every time my mind would say, ah, today is the day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my ego today, my ego got smarter. It was like there was some coach in me who was playing both sides. You know, so in, a, in a sporting game, you know, each team has its own private strategy. And it was as though there was something in my mind that was kind of going back and forth between the highest part of my mind that knew what my strategy of the day was to battle the ego and would go and whisper to the ego what my strategy of the day was. 
and the ego would get smarter. And so if that was going to be the day that I was going to live from my heart, for example, well, the ego would put on the clothes and put on the mask and speak as my heart. This is your heart speaking. So the ego plays a lot of games. And what I have found is rather than thinking about annihilating it, killing it, doing battle with it, rather than that, Realize that the ego actually is there as your friend. It was formed at an important time of your life due to things that your karmic package chose for you to experience. Remember, we're choosing that which we live through. We were talking about this last night. So whatever my family of origin is, whatever the experiences that I had that have formed that ego, well, on some deep level, I chose them. And so the ego has come. It's not like somebody injected me in my sleep and I was just, you know, this pure, wonderful, spiritual victim and somebody came in and injected me with this horrible ego. It's been formed through experiences that I chose through ways that with the tools that I had at that time, I was doing my best to navigate my way through a particular situation, whether it was just development in our youth. This is when the ego starts to develop. Whatever it is that has formed the aspects of my ego, they didn't come in with this horrible intention of, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to ruin her life. I'm going to be that seed that when it sprouts, I'm going to... didn't come in like that. And so for me, what has, has been a much more successful approach is to be able to look at the ego, to see it, because it's not nearly so scary when you're actually looking at it. When you turn your back to it and you figure that you're going to outrun the ego, ignore the ego, it has a completely different power over you. But when you have that, that courage to just, all right, show me what you got, it tends to fizzle my favorite metaphor, way of thinking about this, is the Wizard of Oz. How many of you are familiar with the story of the Wizard of Oz? Raise your hand. All right, enough of you. But for those of you who aren't, one line synopsis. Beautiful story, lots of wonderful metaphors, but the important one is there's this wizard who is... terrorizing in many ways, a tyrant in many ways, over a town. And three beings go to face the wizard. Now, the wizard always exists behind this curtain. When they get there, this dog pulls away the curtain that the wizard is sitting behind. And it turns out that instead of being this massive being, everybody thought he was this massive being, but he's not a massive being. He's actually a tiny little man with a projector. And he was only strong as long as he was behind the curtain. And I have actually found the same thing about the ego. Tyrannical when we don't look at it tyrannical when we allow it to stay behind that curtain, but actually quite small when you pull back the curtain and look at it. And so we look at it. We accept it in its existence as part of us. Okay, not our highest self, not our truest self, not our fullest self, nonetheless, a part of this creation. But we don't allow it to run the show. 
I see it, I embrace it, because in that embrace it lets go of its death grip on my life. What the ego really wants is just to be seen, just to be heard, just for someone to remember, yeah, yeah, I exist. Okay, you exist, wonderful. Have a nice day. Welcome to the party. No, you don't get to run the show. And if we expand our experience of self enough that it's not me or ego, it's not this battle, who's going to win? But I expand my awareness of the self enough that, yeah, yeah, there also exists this ego. But it isn't who I am. It's just a, a, an aspect, an aspect in the infiniteness of who I am that came during various aspects of my, my development, past lives, in utero, this life, conscious, unconscious. The only dilemma comes when I allow the ego to run the show, when I allow the ego to be the one calling the orders, driving the car. And so when we talk about this balance as the question asked of the ego and the heart, well, it's not so much about balancing them. It's about recognizing the ego, because when you don't recognize it is when it wreaks havoc on you. The ego is only dangerous when I deny its existence. When I'm able to look at it, and see it, it's not dangerous. But I allow the heart to actually be the place that I sit in, that I exist from, that I make decisions from. That becomes my anchor. The ego operates in the mind. It's all in the mind. And so the more that our spiritual practice can bring us into the breath, into the heart, into the intuition, into the energy of connection, the ego doesn't have a place there. Because the mind doesn't have a place there. Because separation doesn't have a place there. Think about it. Think for a moment about just hugging someone you love. Okay, You can either be thinking about the fact that you are hugging that person. You can think about what are they thinking about. Or you can be hugging that person. You can either be experiencing love in your heart. Or you can be thinking about it in your head. You can't be doing both. And the same is true when we are living in love with creation. It's a lot easier to think about when you think about just hugging one person. But when you think about moving through the world, connected, it doesn't have to be physically, of course. Because the hug is just the way of experiencing that energetic connection. But when you get deep enough in the energy, It's there even if you're feet apart, thousands of miles apart. And so when we drop into that experience of love, of consciousness, of divinity, of truth, of energy, of whatever word you want to use for it, soul, spirit, it's all the same. They're just different words for the same experience. But you can't do it from the mind, which means the ego can't be involved. But the ego, interestingly, interestingly, if you can make it your ally, can help get you there. Because if you can allow it to stop thinking that it's going to be annihilated, it can actually be the one to help you get to a situation in which you set an alarm to get up every day and meditate, and you actually do. And you actually don't hit the snooze button, and you actually get up. 
It can actually be the one to help you make the decisions in your life in alignment with your heart. If it knows, it's not going to be annihilated in the process. And so don't worry about annihilating it right now. But also don't think about how do I bring it into balance. The ego is there anyway. See it. Acknowledge it. Thank it for what it's done. But don't give it any control. Bring that level of focus, of attention, of intention, of the place from where I make decisions to the heart. And what you'll find is that the hold of the ego dissipates automatically. The less attention you give to it, the more its hold dissipates. Anyway, it'll come up every now and again. And then you see it, and then you say, wow, God, I almost forgot you existed. Want a cup of tea? And then you send it on its way. Not annihilating it, not I'm going to kill you, I'm going to squash you, I'm going to... None of that. But, no, you can't drive this car, no, you can't make the decisions, no, you're not in charge, and no, I'm not going to let you be the one with the microphone in my mind. Because what the ego loves to do is be the one who grabs the microphone in our mind. And so we have to make sure that it doesn't have a mic. And that's what pulling that curtain back does. Because as long as we're not looking at it, it seems very loud and very large. So have a look at it. It's not nearly as big or as scary as you think. And then drop back into your heart. Before taking any of the other questions that came in advance, I'm, I'm happy to open it up if there are any questions here. Yeah. It's good. Enthusiasm is fantastic. Yes. Say this one more time. If we? If we take every work from ego, hmm. right, will it not get angry? Or not? So if we take away the power of the ego, if we take away the work of the ego, the job. So the ego was the CEO, the chairman of the board, the managing director, all the way down to the guy in the mailroom. The ego did everything. Now we say you don't get to make the decision. So he's worried, is it going to get angry? Okay? So let's imagine for a moment it's angry. Who's angry? That's a question. Who's angry? Okay. Well, how can beliefs be angry? <coughs> Who's angry? Imagine that there is that anger in there. As you've just asked, who is it that's angry? It's not me, angry. Hmm. Then where's the anger from? Mm -hmm. who's, who's generating the anger in your mind? Hmm? So I apologize for putting you on the spot. I try not to do that to people. I know it's not a super comfortable position to be in. But thank you for doing that. The issue is we really think <coughs> that there is this power somehow of a being that isn't me, but that somehow gets to run its own show in my mind. Imagine you're driving down the side of the, the road, driving your car, Suddenly somebody opens the door, jumps in, grabs the steering wheel, right? Okay, we call that carjacking, right? It's illegal. It's a crime. What are you going to do? 
Yeah, you're going to push them out. Are you going to say, oh, all right, no problem. I'll just strap myself into the back seat. Sure, wherever you want to go, no problem. You're going to do whatever you can do to push them out. Because you understand this guy should not be in the driver's seat of my car. And so if the ego gets angry, what that means is I'm not conscious in that moment. It means I, the I who is saying I'm going to make decisions from my heart, where'd, where'd that guy go? How did the ego manage to unseat him? It means he took a nap. He was asleep at the wheel. And that becomes the dilemma. And this is why we practice mindfulness, meditation, being present, whatever term we use for it, being conscious. Because if I'm awake at the wheel, you're not going to grab it from me. You're only going to grab it from me if I'm distracted. If I decide, oh, I know, let me check my Facebook. And then I see something. I think, oh, my God, how'd that guy post that? That's not, that's not fair. I'm distracted. Guy gets in and pushes me out of the driver's seat. I voluntarily left the driver's seat. But if I'm conscious, The ego is not going not gonna to get back in the driver's seat. And what you find is there stop being two of you or three of you. This is, this is what I talk about going to sleep with the loser. A lot of us, we think about, oh, my ego, my this, as though, as though we had lots of beings in us. And it's, it's one way to think about it. But the dilemma is on the highest level. The highest level, it's just, it's just us. And there's, there's truth and there's untruth. So there's not actually another being in me. What there is, is what we're going to call my past sanskaras. My past sanskaras that say, they don't get angry out of the blue. It's my past sanskaras that say, who the hell do you think you are? How dare you? You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not rich enough. You can't do that. What are the neighbors going to say? Who do you think you are? That's the voice. That's the ego getting angry. Those are the voices of my past sanskaras, of the impressions that have been laid upon me. And that's okay. Voices of the universe. Parents, teachers, culture, society, who knows, whatever it is. But that's not your highest truth. And you know that. And that's why it's so important to keep dropping back into your highest truth. And when those voices are there, don't try to fight them off. But don't allow yourself to jump on that thought. What most of us do is that thought comes, who the hell do you think you are? You're... You're too ugly, you're too stupid, you're too poor, you're too this, you're too that. Don't listen to that. Who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to do this? What about this? What will the neighbors say? Look, kya kya hengi, kya so chengi. And what most of us do is we jump on that and we follow it into misery. Our, our thoughts are vehicles. 
If somebody said to you, guess what? Good friend says to you, guess what? I got you a first class ticket. Super comfy seats, great entertainment, first class ticket. What are you going to ask him? Well, before you come with him, what are you going to ask him? Ab vaise jayenge? Aapka koi idea nahi hai kahan ja rahe ho? Kya puchhenge? Hmm, where are you going? Kahan chalna? And then if he says to hell. What are you going to do? Even it's a first class seat? Free entertainment? You sure? So I'm playing with him, but the truth is obviously none of us would go. Somebody said first class ticket, best best seats in the house, brand new airplane, cushy seats. But obviously we're not going to go. Where is it going? Hell, misery, depression. I'm not going to go. But what happens in our minds is these thoughts come. What he's calling the ego getting angry. which is just these past sanskaras of my fear of my indoctrination of the ego of my false identity all of the things i've taken in during my life from my family of origin from teachers from my culture from a tv show from god knows where it's gone in there are now the voices in my head the thought comes and i jump on even though i know this is going to hell because i've taken it before i know exactly where that thought goes this is not a new thought it's not a new ego you've lived with that guy for a long time you know you know every trick in his hat and you know exactly where those thoughts go and so when those thoughts come You do exactly what you would do when your friend says I've got a first class ticket to hell for you. you. Say thank you so much. Have a wonderful trip. I'm going to stay here. <coughs> And you allow that thought. So we talk about just, you know, blowing across our consciousness like wispy clouds. <coughs> so it blows across. And you stay anchored. And you stay anchored in your heart. If you've got a mantra, it's a beautiful time to remember that you've got a mantra, to chant that mantra. If you don't have a mantra, find one. If you have a guru, get it from the guru. If you don't have a guru, choose any mantra that works for you. The mantra becomes like a lifeboat that literally carries you across. from this vehicle that's about to sweep you up and <clears throat> take you on a voyage to misery and you're about to willingly get on but the mantra and the breath bring you back into the moment back into the truth back into yourself and what you'll find slowly slowly is those thoughts dissipate we have new sanskaras In science we talk about neural networks, neural patterning, and spirituality we talk about sanskaras impressions. Same thing. Create a new one. And this is such a beautiful day to do it. At this time of Diwali, we literally we start new checkbooks, we start new accounts. Many people consider this is the new year time. Everything is new. So it's the time that we get rid of patterns within us that are old. When water stops flowing, it festers. That's where you get disease. When you stop flowing, you fester. That's where you get disease. That's where misery comes from as I'm stuck. And so this is a beautiful time to allow that new sanskara, that new pattern to start. 
And lastly, the best way to fight anger is with love. If you've got a kid, do you have children? Have you ever babysat? Do you have any like young nieces or nephews? Okay. So if you see a kid throwing a temper tantrum, the mistake that people make is they try to yell at him or yell at her, which of course never works unless you terrorize the kid so completely that they end up afraid of their own impulses for their entire life. But what really works is you give that kid a really big hug. You take that child in your arms and you love it until the temper tantrum stops. You're not holding him or her to repress them. It's not about that. It's just here's a container of love. Flail yourself around, no problem. I'm going to keep holding you. I'm going to keep loving you. And when the ego is angry, just meet it with love. Just stay in your heart. Stay in your heart. And those feelings will dissipate because the anger is actually fear. The ego is angry at you because it's afraid of where you're going. And if you can create a beautiful container of love, it'll soften and dissipate. Beautiful. Wonderful. Have a beautiful rest of your evening. And we will gather tomorrow, and I hope everyone can join us a bit early in the Arti tomorrow. We're going to have a beautiful puja ceremony, a Lakshmi puja, Ganesh puja, in, in the Arti tomorrow, just before the Arti, and then a, a special satsang tomorrow evening, a candlelit satsang tomorrow evening. A beautiful night, and we'll see you all tomorrow on the sacred, sacred day of Diwali. Mm -hmm.